Thanks, Owen, and, and welcome, everybody. So Stephen really has asked me to set the scene here and just give a bit of context as to why we've asked Stephen to come over, but just to give a bit of background on COP21. Some of you may have been included in the information updates that we were giving you around COP21 and what we found happened and, and the outputs from there. I have a few slides you can, you can follow. Um, but what I wanted to do is, re is really break down COP21. What, what we saw out there was that there was a lot of conversation about this was not a very meaningful COP, this was something that was, was fairly fluffy. But when you dive into the detail and you think about the parties that were involved, there were three main areas. There was the government negotiations. That was, what are we going to agree at an international level to achieve on climate change? The fact that we've even achieved consensus that needs to be action on climate change is, a, is, a, is an advance in itself. When you think then also about the business environment, now this was something that was less publicized but was very interesting. We saw a huge amount of actions around investors but also corporate level commitments to set two degree targets or to set various <coughs> reduction targets or to set ambitions <coughs> to invest in low carbon technology and to create a trajectory towards a, zero, a net zero carbon world, which is something that you'll see there as one of the outcomes as being we will live in a carbon neutral world at some point between 2050 and 2100. That's a very clear message that governments aim to achieve and it's, it's something that came out of COP21 and, and very encouraging. The, the peaking greenhouse gases as soon as possible. Again, that's, that sounds quite fluffy. That's all around the China context. That's all about what's going on in China, that they agree that they need to be growing and continue to grow, and why should they be penalized in the same level that we've grown on a, on a, on a fossil fuel trajectory? They, they want that exposure as well. So that's to peak as soon as possible, but by 2030 at the latest. But what, what do we see coming out of COP21, and what can we expect? That's what the box at the bottom there is really talking about. And I'm only going to focus on a, on a couple of those areas. The first one about regulation. There's going to be a tightening around regulation. Governments are saying that this is important and this is something we need to focus on. So governments are going to impose various restrictions or various regulation around those topics. Interestingly, Mark Carney from the Bank of England was talking about transparency around reporting. So I'd say reporting, whether you're an investor, reporting or a financial institution, reporting on your ESG policies, that that's something that's been coming and, and gaining more traction, or whether you're a corporate and reporting on your emissions or broader sustainability topics, that's another area that we're seeing quite a lot on. I'm talking about the costs, higher costs. So if you're not leading on this agenda, if you're not a company that's starting to just adapt to this change and, and starting to lead on the agenda, costs are going to be a problem. But if you see this as an opportunity and something you can launch into early, it's most certainly an opportunity for you. So the polluter pays sort of principle coming in there is, is something we're seeing a little bit of um, traction on there. The incentive sides, again, that comes down to the government initiatives, the various areas, and I'll talk about that in a bit, in a bit more detail shortly. But also importantly, <coughs> thinking of the full value chain. This isn't something that's going to be right at the end. Whoever has the, the, the pollution coming out of their chimney is going to pay for this. It's a much broader agenda all the way through the value chain. So thinking about corporates, how you produce uh, your, your goods, where does that come from, and who should be associated with the responsibility for that. So that's just a, a high level on on COP21, I think the first point there is that there has been a global agreement. That, that's the most foundation point, is that we have actually got consensus that climate change is happening and that the world needs to move forward with that acknowledgement. On this page, I think, I think it's really important, rather than just talking about the high level areas, actually to see what, what, what's the, what does that actually mean? What does that actually mean that we've got to focus on? And I think what we, what we saw here really is four key areas that we're going to see change in. Technology innovation, financing, so mobilizing finance, capacity building, and then how do you make sure that people are accountable and reporting about this? So if we take the first area there, technology implementation, what does that actually mean? It means that with this agenda, we're going to see a transformation of the global power systems, the power production, transport, and industrial processes. What does that actually mean, and how much is that going to cost? That's where the finance comes in. And what we're talking about here is it's both a challenge, 
How, how do we revolutionize this, an existing system? And it's also an opportunity. How do we find the finance to support that? I read a statistic recently that it's $44 trillion US dollars is required to decarbonize global power supply. I mean, that's a phenomenal amount of money. And this is on the back of an agreement that we will live in a carbon neutral world. So when we join the two together, there's quite a compelling story. You start talking there about some of the solutions, you start talking about storage, you start talking about off-grid solutions. That side of things, that's where it gets really interesting. And I'd like to talk for hours about that, but we haven't got time today, I've been told by Stephen. So mobilizing finance, and that's really the area that we're interested with, with Sean today. What mechanisms are there to help us to mobilize finance and to work in this area? I think importantly, off the back of COP21, the confidence for investors has in, improved enormously. Governments are setting a vision. Investors are driving that with them. So what we're seeing there is a lot of movement around responsible investment, around reputation attached to this sort of investment, and, and, and various bits of traction there. We're seeing divestment from fossil fuels. Now, that's still only a drop in the ocean, but it's getting a lot of publicity. It's something that people are finding interesting. I think it's important also, and we'll come on to that shortly, but to think not just about private finance when we talk about finance, but to think of the public money that's also <coughs> available. So a large part of COP21 and what came out of that was actually the public finance that's needed to support developing countries in moving in a low carbon trajectory. So I think we must consider that element as well and how that can be used to support and harness more finance for other areas from the private sector. Capacity building, I'll just skip, skip through this one really. Capacity building, how do we train people up to understand what we're talking about? How do we make sure that those in poor countries, small, small companies, whatever it might be, how do they understand this agenda and how can they leapfrog from an existing position via the fossil fuel world and straight into a low carbon pathway? That's an, in, an interesting discussion and certainly capacity building, something that Ireland would be, would be good at and have contacts with and have the knowledge base here to be able to share that globally. And finally, the accounting and reporting. So the accountability side is who's responsible for these emissions and who's responsible for this journey that we're taking. How do we report on that? And then I know Sean will talk a little bit about verifying that and making sure that this is being reported and recorded correctly. Countries at a country level from COP21 will need to report back on their progress against targets on a five-year basis. So they as a country themselves aren't gonna achieve that. It's gonna be the responsibility of business to help them meet those targets. And it's pulling those elements together and making making sure that it's very clearly reported. So what we've done there, we've kind of set the scene on COP21. What did that achieve? Then we go down and we talk about, okay, well, so what does that actually mean for business? And there's the finance element comes in there. What I wanted to talk about here really are the contents of the finance elements. So what you'll see here is, is it's, I tend to break it down into, into project, market and public funding. Those are the ones that spring to mind for me that are most relevant after COP21. When I talk about project, I mean asset-based finance and, and investment. So this is where your investors come in. This is where they're getting interested and, and included. And the new technology market, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Green bonds is becoming an increasingly important element of that market. It's becoming a finance mechanism for supporting growth in new technology. But alongside that, unless a mechanism, but actually more a sentiment or a policy, is around the ESG market and how institutional and, and responsible investors are expecting corporates or businesses to portray that they're doing this in a, in a more holistic way and more considering non-financial elements in the way they do business. The market-based area, I'm just going to talk very briefly about emissions trading scheme. That's something that's becoming more and more interesting for both countries and corporates. So how are you going to start uh, trading credits on carbon internally within countries or externally within different markets? But also an interesting element is what companies are doing with an internal market for trading in terms of carbon credits internally. You'd, you'd normally seen that in, in large mining companies or within large sort of institutions that are, that are operating globally with various kind of decentralized business units. And finally, the, the, the public funding element there is what I talked about briefly there around the public money and how that can be used to support private projects in 
risky, risky areas. So the Green Climate Fund was set up a number of years ago, or the, the, the idea, the concept for the Green Climate Fund was set up a number of years ago, and, and that has been reinforced at COP21 this year. There will be a pool of money, $100 billion per year from 2020, provided from developing, developed countries to developing countries to help them progress and, and develop in a low carbon way. So that's, that's another interesting point. But what I really want to do is set the scene for Sean to come and give you all his knowledge um, and, and to give you a bit of background and some of the really easy high-level points on green bonds. And then you can ask Sean all the awkward questions. Um, what is a green bond? A green bond is the same as any other bond. It operates in the same way, but it's for raising capital for environmental, for projects with environmental and social benefits. That's, that's the only fundamental difference. Attached to that are various benefits and, um, and, and drawbacks that, that, that are attached to that, and you can see those towards the bottom of the page. But commonly and traditionally, but we might see this evolve, and Sean can talk about that, is that the projects are normally around large-scale renewable energy efficiency, forestry, or transport projects that you see out there. But perhaps we can talk about grouping some of the more innovative solutions together into a package and, and providing bonds in that, in that sense. But it's become increasingly popular around institutional investors also corporates to a lower extent, but I think the movement really is institutional investors at this, at this point. Should we label a bond green? That's a question we often get, you know, why, why would we choose to label it green? And some of the benefits there are investors are interested in it. It's something that reputationally differentiates it from other forms of bond, and it's a subject that's become more and more important, especially post, post COP21. They're often oversubscribed. Sean will be able to talk about that and the volume that there's been more recently. It's good for your reputation, for corporate reputation or investor reputation. It ticks a few of those boxes. But drawbacks may be around the reporting. It does require a little more scrutiny around where the money's going and, and alignment to certain criteria that you must meet, which may make it, it slightly different for, for yourselves compared to a traditional bond. And then how do you define it? Sean will again be able to talk about this because it's principles and standards are being developed in the marketplace that allow you to follow those and to label it as a green bond. We then at KPMG can come and do external independent verification of those bonds. And in speaking to Sean earlier, he said, actually, we often don't look twice if a, if a company has issued a green bond and it hasn't been externally verified by an independent party. So that's something you, you can ask Sean about or, or ourselves about in, in the future. But really, just to open the floor to Sean after a really brief jump through those hoops. Um, but thank you very much. <laughs>